Today, I'm going to attempt to talk about aspiration or lack of aspiration or no need for aspiration in photography. After my photography is dying video, which was a bit of clickbait really to attract attention, it was a bit of an experiment, it worked. And I had some amazing, interesting comments. I had the normal bots and trolls. And then I had some complete idiots that said, they're sickened by talking head videos. Well, this is a talking head and um, this is what I do. So as my dad used to say, if you don't like it, watch something else. And there's millions of videos on YouTube and there's hundreds of television stations and satellite stations and everything. So I'm sure there's quite a lot to watch. Um, but just I guess some people just feel the need to write negativity everywhere. But I knew it would happen. I knew it would draw people like that in. This one's a sort of counter argument to photography is dying. It's more about aspiration, lack of aspiration or no need in aspiration. It's more about, like a couple of the comments said in the last one, some people just want to kick a ball about. So we'll discuss that one today. So where do we begin? It's a bit of a hard one, but I think for the people that watch my channel and carry on watching my channel and don't just watch one video and don't come back, this is a waste of time. But for the people that know me and have known my past and everything, a lot of you don't know everything. So let's start off with that. Um, I've always, how would you put it, aspired or wanted to be the best that I could be in the thing that I do. So how do I explain that? I'm dyslexic. So I struggled at school. I had a bad time at school. I probably was the class clown and I excelled in art and sport, but I wasn't very good academically at all. In fact, I couldn't read and write most of the way through school. The first book I ever read was when I left school properly, um, apart from what I was forced to. My worst days at school were the days when they made you stand up in class and read from a book. I wasn't there. I was off sick or I was hiding or whatever. I even nearly got expelled from school for being drunk. Um, so my aspiration in that at the time was completely different to what you think. So I played roller hockey when I was at school and I played in goal and I ended up playing roller hockey in the England team. I then swam and I swam for Kent. I didn't carry on swimming and the reason I didn't carry on swimming because my times were just off, like I'm not talking close, I'm talking just off Mark Spitz's time, but I'm five foot ten. The people that would be able to beat me were six footers, nearly seven footers, that could actually get through the water faster than me with longer limbs. I never stood a chance of ever being able to compete in competitive swimming because of my size. So I decided then with the roller hockey experience which helped my legs and I did quite a lot of cycling at the time that I would then go on from there and I did powerlifting. I'd done weightlifting and then powerlifting and my powerlifting, I won the British bench and I come seventh in the world at the time and people would ask, why did you not continue? Well, the reason I didn't continue is because I got hit by a car and broke my back and I was in hospital for a long time. You know, at the time then I had a 250 bench, 350 squat and 350 deadlift and I was increasing from there and I could have done really, really well. The damage to my spine from the car accident finished me off. I couldn't do it anymore and I still can't do it to this day. I still wish I could go back in the gym and do it, but I know I wouldn't even be able to walk. I've even got warned if I ever got knocked off a bike again, I'd never be able to walk again. At the time I had the accident, I was told you will never walk again. I broke my back, I was lying in hospital and I was determined that wouldn't happen. In a short space of time after that, my tools were all returned to me at the time I worked at Brands Hatch as a workshop manager. My tools were all returned to me at my house and I looked like I'd never be able to work again. I was lucky, I got myself together, I suddenly started getting feeling back in my legs once all the swelling went down and everything else and I, re I healed. I then couldn't go back to work, so I decided to start a partnership and work with a guy and start my own business. Now then, we had an empty unit with nothing in it, and we had to get this ready to open in an X amount of time. By luck, by luck, a company come along and wanted to put their scooters into our shop, because I was gonna open a motorcycle sales service repair business. So they wanted to put 50 to 80,000 pounds worth of scooters in our business, but we had to open on a certain date for that to happen. 
We were there day and night. I was actually physically going outside and being sick because of the pain in my back still to get this floor welded in, to get the walls painted, to get this place ready to open on time. That was sheer determination. And I'm not saying that people that have back injuries can never walk again because they can't. I was just lucky and to this day, I feel very, very lucky. I've had moments since then, I get back pain regularly ever since that day. And I've had moments since then where I've not gone back to hospital and thinking about having an operation in my back and then suddenly it's all just sorted itself out again. Now, whether, why, I don't know. That's not aspirational, it's just a little bit of information about me. I am determined I will keep going at something. When I did control and restraint in a job I did, I've become the best that I could be at control and restraint. I even taught control and restraint. I was started off very early in life as a butcher's assistant. I worked my way up through that and I become a butchery manager and then I taught butchery, right? If anyone ever is a butcher or ever been a butcher out there, my top bits were under three and a half minutes. I was one of the fastest to teach people to go on safe base meat plant production line. So I can teach people and if people want to be good at something, they will always be good at it if they find the way. Now I'm going to break all this down in a minute. When I first started photography, I don't think I wanted to be a professional photographer. I just enjoyed the process and the art of taking photographs. And you've got to remember back in those days, it was film. So to even get a shot was a miracle in the first place because you had to learn exposure triangle and you had to learn exposure or you'd either end up with a completely white shot or a black shot where it's under or overexposed until you got it right. It's a great learning curve and I enjoyed every minute of it and you don't have to do that these days except if you did it, it would help you in certain aspects of your photography. On my last video, a lot of the comments were but, but people just want to kick a ball around in a park. I, I've never kicked a ball around in a park, so I don't know why people will want to do that anyway. But what I would say is, I draw. I love my art, I do a lot of drawing, and I do not want to be a professional artist and sell my work. So I understand if people want to kick a ball around in a park, I understand if people just want to draw, and I understand if people just want to do photography. Let me get that straight. I understand if people just want to do something for a hobby. If you want to be an amateur photographer, and take photographs and just do it yourself, that's absolutely fine. My videos about people aspiring to be something and being lazy is about those people that want to be a professional footballer, a professional photographer, a professional chef, a professional something, but don't want to put the effort and time in to get there. Now, at the end of the day, in this day and age, photography is all of many things, and that is, a professional photographer is very hard to get to that level. Obviously a professional photographer is someone, I think it is still someone that earns 95% of their income from their profession. So a plumber would be, a, you know, a professional plumber would be someone that earns, so they don't have to be any good as a plumber. In fact, they could be shy. It's just someone, that's what a professional is. And I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about someone that is the top of their game in a sport, an Olympic champion. Of photography if you want to put it that way. Someone that's put the time and effort in to get to that point. I've worked in and around photography and I've done photography all my life. In the forces I did a load of photography. I did photography when I was a kid and I've done it at all different levels and all different standards and I wouldn't say I'm the top of my game. I'm a th I would say I'm still learning. I still want to get somewhere different. The thing is with photography you can branch out in all different aspects and with photography these days you could want to aspire to be a brand ambassador for like Fujifilm or Nikon or Canon or someone like that. That's become so complicated over the years. It's a discussion for another day. Um, someone said something in my um, video the other day underneath and I, I won't point it out because it comes across as a bit weird, but I will touch on this at some point. Now, if you want to be a brand ambassador for someone, it's a simple process. I've written about it and I've got videos about it back in the past. And if you go to my blog, you'll probably find it. But if you want to be a brand ambassador for someone, one of the things to do is not what everyone tries to do these, these days is go and blag a camera and try and do that sort of thing. And that is use their brand of camera, have been using them for a long time and use all your social media and hashtags to draw their attention to you and your brand. And they might choose your brand to work with them. That's one thing you might want to be doing. That's what a lot of young kids want to do through X Factor era. And that is they want to become someone like that. Now, there is 
a certain amount of money in that, but you won't earn a good living for that unless you have something you do yourself as well. The likes of Kevin Mullins, who's a Fujifilm ambassador, or was a Fujifilm ambassador, he had his own wedding business. He shot 50 to 100 weddings a year, and that brought his main income in. His income was topped up, maybe, if you want to call it from Fujifilm, but not a great amount of money, the same as mine wasn't. At the end of the day, you've got to be able to have your own business before you can work for these people. They're not going to pay your wages for the rest of your life. It's as simple as that. So that's an aspect. Another aspect is if you want to be an amateur photographer and take lovely photographs and you can learn that skill set yourself to get there, fine, go and do that. There's nothing wrong with that. I appreciate it all. The people I'm knocking are the people that can't even do that without coming to someone to learn and then bashing the person that's trying to teach them. And that's another video for another day as well. Trust me, in all the years I ever taught photography, you'd always get someone on a workshop that wants to tell me how to take a photograph. And I've always found that absolutely incredible because why pay 40, 50 pounds to come on my workshop to learn from me and to learn my style and my skill set if you're gonna try and tell me how to do it? Because obviously you come here to learn something, I don't need to learn from you and I don't want to learn from you. In all the time I've ever been teaching workshops, I've hardly ever picked anything up from the people that have come on my workshops, apart from a few. I'm not going to name them. And that's because we've had long, meaningful conversations during the workshop, after the workshop, and we've become friends. And I like what they do, and they may like what I do. I don't know. I don't really care if people like what I do, because what I do is for me. When I try and teach, I try and teach someone to get them to where they want to be. Now, if someone wanted to come to me and say, how could I be a Fujifilm ambassador? I'd tell them. I'd design everything I did for them to get them to that point, and they may even get there. No one has actually ever asked me to do that though, which is quite funny, but there is a formula to do something like that, and I could teach that formula. Kevin Mullins teaches wedding photography, or he used to, I think he does, and he still does street photography now. He teaches his style of street photography, I teach my style of street photography. My style of street photography is probably old-fashioned and it's like the masters, and the modern style of street photography is Photoshop the shit out of it. That doesn't work for me because it doesn't work, it doesn't even look right. It hasn't got any soul or emotion. At the end of the day, soul and emotion is what I want. And my photography is different to other people's. Going back to the Talking Heads video, no, I don't show my work on YouTube. I don't do these videos and then start putting loads of photographs in. Um, Sean Tucker and people put lo loads of um, sayings in, loads of photographs in, this sort of thing. I prefer you to go away from here, go and look at my Instagram. I've got rid of everything else. You can go and look at my Instagram. I know they're not very big pictures, but you can open them up. But if you go away from here and you look at my photographs, that gives you time to look at my photographs at your leisure, in your time, and see what I do. And the same as on my blog. You can read my blog and look at my photographs. Just watching them go past your eyes on here, I don't think works. When I look at other people's videos, like Sean's and some of the other YouTube guys, I watched their video and five minutes later, I've forgotten what I've seen. I've come away from the YouTube stuff and I've gone to look at Sean's blog or Sean's uh, Instagram and this, that, and the other one, and I look at his work. And it's a whole different meaning and a whole different ball game in photography. So where am I going with this today? You can't wait to see the comments below, by the way. It's going to be hilarious. But anyway, I'm talking about lazy people. And when I say lazy people, I'm talking about the people that start out to think I'm going to be an ambassador for someone. They pester them online on social media to get camera gear. They hassle them all the time. They have got no body of work in photography. They're not a very good photographer. They aspire to be ambassador, but they can't ever get there because they want to do it in three weeks and you can't do it in three weeks. To work for Fujifilm probably took me maybe two years, I don't know. You have a formula in your head, you work towards that end goal and then you get there. Two years maybe, I don't know. I'd have to look back to see. Um, and if I wanted to work for another brand now, it would probably take two to three years. Uh, a lot of people would say I'm the wrong gender and the wrong um, ethnicity these days to do that. And that's a load of shit, right? At the end of the day, I know some absolutely amazing photographers that work for different brands. And it doesn't matter. None of that matters. It's all just bullshit. Because at the end of the day, if you aspire to do something, you can do it. 
because you're still going to be the perfect fit for somebody. At the moment, I'm on a different journey. My journey at the moment is to carry on with my projects, to produce some more bodies of work, to actually get somewhere personally for me, what you might call a personal best. Now, as a powerlifter, every time you train, you don't train to win a competition, you train to beat yourself every day. You train to beat your personal best. If your personal best was 100 kilos today and you want to get 105 kilos tomorrow, 110 kilos the next day, you work towards that. You'll do a training plan and training program to be able to lift better weights and heavier weights every time. And you'll keep training and training and training. And my, my, my cycle then was a 12-week cycle. I would lift to see what my best was, do a 12-week cycle, lift, lift to see what my best was again and hopefully get an improvement. And every time I did that, I did. I made small gains and sometimes big gains. It depends whether it's legs, arms or whatever, or whatever, whatever you were doing, squat, bench or dead. At the end of the day, you have to work hard to get there. I couldn't just walk into a gym and suddenly become a British powerlifting champion. It's absolutely impossible. You have to do the work and you have to train your body to do that. For me, photography is no different. You can't just pick up a camera and become a photographer. You can pick up a camera and become a camera owner. But then there's the process of learning photography. Yes, of course, for all the people that are gonna look at this and write shit underneath, yes, you can pick up an iPhone and go and take photographs. I'm not talking about people that just want to take snaps every day of the week. There are millions and billions of photographs being taken every day of the week by people that just want to take photographs. They sit on their phones, they never do anything with them. They're with their dinner, their dog, their cat, their mouse, the, a leaf in the woods. There's a whole difference between someone that's just taking photographs, someone that then thinks, I quite like this, I want to become good at photography. That person may just want to learn to be good at photography. Not for any other reason, they must want to learn, they might, might, might want to learn, why is that dark? Why is this, this? Why is, they start asking themselves questions and they start to teach themselves photography. They then may move off from an iPhone onto a, a mirrorless camera or a DSLR or something. And then they might try to learn that and they realize it's a lot more difficult than they thought. And then they might go on a course and they might go on a workshop and then they might aspire to be a street photographer and not cheat at it and Photoshop the living shit out of it because that doesn't work, as I said, it has no soul. But I'm talking about the people that want to progress but are too bloody lazy to progress. I'm not talking about the people that just want to stay at different levels because that's absolutely fine. If you want to stay at a level and just go and photograph wildlife, if you want to stay at a level and just photograph people in the street, that's fine. I've got nothing against anyone at any level in anything, right? I've taught people to bone out me. I've taught people to power lift. I've taught people to do control and restraint. I've, done, I've taught people a load of things and I understand how people work. Some people get to a certain point and think, fuck this, this isn't for me and go and do something else. I spent my life doing different things because I've had a change of mind. I do my art now and I do it sporadically. Most of the time when I'm away in my camper van, I sit and draw something or I sit at this desk sometimes and I draw. I have to be in the right frame of mind and the right mood to draw. Otherwise, I just look at a blank piece of paper and nothing comes out, nothing flows out of me. If I wanted to learn to be a great artist, I would find the artist that I loved and I'd go to them to get them to help me, to teach me how to create my own art in my own style to get what I wanted. So I'm talking about people into photography that want to learn, that are too lazy to put the time in to learn. There's a lot of difference between that person, i.e. the person that kicks a ball around in the park, and the person that wants to play for Liverpool or whatever and become a professional footballer. There's a lot of difference. And you can't tell me that that person kicking a ball around who wants to be a professional photographer could be there in a week. A guy, I am going to say this, a guy put in my last video that um, you can learn to be a, a carpenter on YouTube in six weeks instead of six years or something like that. Well, I wouldn't get that person to hang a door for me. Trust me, I wouldn't. The same as I wouldn't get a YouTube mechanic to fix my bloody car for me, right? The same as I wouldn't get someone that's had a camera for six weeks to work for me as a photographer because they can't do the job. I know a girl now who's really, really famous, and she tells this story so I can tell the story, Lara Jade. When, her, when she first got her first job, she 
almost screwed it up because she realized she didn't have the skill set she didn't know enough about lighting she didn't know enough about the situation she walked into a room she had to photograph something for a client and she didn't know what she was doing so she couldn't fake it as such till she made it because she screwed up her first assignment she then went away and learned and caught up and now she's really famous and she gets on really really well and she does know Trust me, if you've picked up a camera for the first time and you tell someone you're going to go and photograph their family, they ain't going to be photographed with their... They're not going to be happy with the shots. Well, they might be if they haven't got a clue what they're looking at. And that's another problem. Not only the Dunning-Kruger effect, but also people that haven't got a clue what a good photograph is. You know, some people on Facebook, etc., etc., still put photographs on their headers with horizons like that. And until you point out that horizon's wonky, they didn't see it. And if they can't see that one simple thing in a photograph, they can't see all the rest that's wrong. Because believe me, if you look at a photograph, you think, well, that's all out of balance. That composition's all wrong. The horizon's not straight. The lighting's awful. I could pick a photograph, if you see Bruce Gilden do it, you can pick a photograph apart easily. I see street photography now, which is absolutely awful. When I say it's awful, it's awful. And people will say, oh, but it's photographing people in the street. But it's not photographing people in the street. It's a lot more complicated than that. Now, this is quite a long video. <laughs> You're probably bored and you've gone. If you've got to this point, good. At the end of the day, I am talking about people that aspire to be something in photography. All the stuff I do is for everybody. Whether you want to be an amateur photographer, whether you're just learning, etc. I'm not here. I am not going to teach anyone how to use a camera in my videos. That's for you to learn. Go away and learn it or go to night school and learn how to use a camera. None of my videos are gonna teach you that because I learnt myself and it's too complicated on a YouTube video to tell you how to use a camera and you retain that knowledge and you learn that knowledge. My videos are for people of probably all ages, especially my age, that want to do something now. And what I'm going to do what I have been doing is talk about my projects because it's a bit like the powerlifting. My projects help you to learn. And that's what my video, my YouTube channel is all about. When I talk about weightlifting, every time you do a 12 week set, you then go out and lift your best. So you do 12 weeks, you lift your best 12 weeks and that goes up and up and up. My channel is about projects. So every time you do a project over 12 months, you look at your work at the end of the year, you make a book at the end of the year, you pick your best shot from that whole year's project, and that is the standard you should be looking at. So you're actually teaching yourself photography because you're editing your own work. And if I get you to take your whole year's work and put that in a book, you are only going to choose, say, your 12 or 24 best shots for your book. Trust me, if you go 40 shots, you're not going to be able to afford to put it in a book because it's 50, 60 quid unless you've got um, expendable income. So the whole point of it is this. If you follow my channel and you want to learn from me, I teach projects. I don't overly teach street photography. There's plenty of people out there if you want to go on their channels and look for that. What I do is I try and help you to progress by being this talking head on this video. I will go out in the street with my friends. I might do some of that type of video just to keep you interested, but I'm mostly about projects. When I've done my end of the year project this year, I'll show you my process of what I do at the end. And I'm showing you my process all the way through. Yes, it's a boring little seven minute talking head, photo, uh, talking head video of where I'm at. And as we all know, I'm not at anywhere yet. And I'm honest about that. So at the end of this year, after this 12 months, I'm going to show you how I edit my photographs down, what I look for, my, how I choose my best photograph of the year and I, how I put them in a book. The following year then, trust me, people that go and shoot out three or 400 images a day, right? And then come back and think they're all great, will learn a lot from this. Because at the end of the day, you won't go and shoot three or 400 images a day once you've done this process. Because at the end of the year, if you're gonna choose your one best image, you know that most of those images you've shot aren't worth anything. So if you make a book at the end of a year of your best images, let's say, say you have 12 or 24 shots and your best image. So you have your main one best image. Following that, you have 24, make, call it 36, of your best photographs for that year. All the rest are a waste of time. You will probably never look at them again and you will probably never remember them because you've chosen your best. 
that's a bit like your best lift. So next year you want to increase on that. If you've shot 34,000 shots this year, and now at the end of the year, you've got to choose your best one and your best 24 or 36. That's a bloody lot of photographs to go through. And you'll then realize that you don't need to take that many. And what are you going to do with all those images? Are they all just going to sit on your hard drive and no one ever look at them forever? That's why you make a book and that's why you choose your best image. So you should have at the end of every year after you've done a project, a book with your 24, 36, 48 images of the year of your project and one print inside that book as your best print. That's your reference. I actually have a friend that's got a whole photo library of that from the moment he started out in photography and it's amazing the journey because when you open the book and look you can see the journey you can see the progress just like a weightlifter you're suddenly at the top of your game you can actually look back through all your books and think god I was shit back then and then you look how good I am now and in 10 years time you think god I was shit 10 years ago that's what my channel's about if you want to learn how to do that keep watching